hear us. Our African voices speak across a vast continent. Our voices speak of many cultures. Sustaining struggles for justice. Invigorating nations. Inspiring new lives. Emotions charge contemporary forms with power. Creativity fuels politics as well as art. Some of our voices carry the rhythm of rural life. Others resound with the temple of the city. All our voices speak, each in its way, of Africa. Today, our voices, African voices, speak from every corner of the earth. In every journey, past and present, carry Africa within us. Hello and welcome to African Voices, a live electronic field trip in the African Voices exhibit of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History. This field trip is brought to you by Project VIEW under the direction of the Schenectady City School District through a grant from the technology, through a technology innovation challenge grant awarded by the U.S. Department of Education. My name is Dottie, and I'm going to be your host through this electronic field trip. I'd like to introduce you to some of the other voices we're going to hear during this broadcast. I have students with me here from Central Park Middle School and Gilderland High School. Hi, guys, and welcome. Hello. And I see you have some things here with you. Can someone tell me what you've brought? It is called in a call from Somalia. The Somalians live in it. So it's a kind of house? Yes. Okay. And why is it in pieces? Because we have not built it yet. So it's a house that has to be built. Mm -hmm. Why do they have to build it like this? So they can live under it and they'll be secure in certain weather. And because they move from location to location as they move their animals and look for new pastures and look for watering sources. Yeah. So you are going to be building the Sakal for us today, aren't you? Yes. What are you going to build it out of? Well, the real things that, we, that they use to build are they use burlap fur to cover and make sure all the weather doesn't get in their house and sticks and yarn to wrap the sticks together. And what, are, what do you guys have here today? This is foam and Velcro to keep the things attached and tape. Okay, I'm going to leave you to begin building your call and then we're going to check back with you a little later on in the show and see how you're doing. Okay. okay. okay? This is a live interactive field trip. And you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there should be a 1-800 number and an email address. You can use them to call or write us and ask questions of our scientists and our experts. And when you call in, you'll need to turn the sound on your monitor down, okay? And we'll run this 1-800 number and the email address periodically throughout the broadcast. What we're going to do now is we're going to start the broadcast by giving you some general important information about Africa, to introduce us to Africa. And then we will move to some more personal stories about Africa. So this next video introduces us to the African continent. Africa is the birthplace of humankind. From the motherland, we have ventured into the world. Sometimes with the joy of discovery. 
sometimes in sorrow. Our spirit and knowledge enabled us to persevere. Hi, my name is Michael Mason. I'm an anthropologist here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. I was fortunate enough to work on the exhibit team that developed this exhibition, African Voices. We went through a long process of consultation with people around the country and around the world to work out a consensus about what Americans should know about Africa. The result of that process is what's on exhibition here at the museum, and it's also the basis of the field trip that we're uh, bringing to you today. We, because the continent is such a large uh, and, and, and diverse place, it's really important to understand that we had to focus on specific messages. And that's how we organized the choices that we made about what to include in this field trip and in the exhibition. Um, first of all, we, we focused on Africa's diversity and dynamism, both in the past and in contemporary times. So the stories that you'll hear today will, will explore those issues. We wanted to show over and over again global connections uh, that Africa has um, with the rest of the world. We wanted to surprise visitors. Uh, as you probably know, there are a lot of stereotypes about Africa, and the exhibition and the field trip are designed to surprise you about what's going on on the continent. And finally, we also uh, wanted to show Africans as the primary actors in their lives. So over and over again, in the hall and in this field trip, you'll get to see Africans talking about their history and their culture and why it's important to them. Now, I also want to give you some general information about Africa. As Dadi said, Africa is an enormous continent. It's about three times the land mass of the United States. To give you a sense of how big that is, it takes about five hours to fly from New York City to Los Angeles um, on the opposite coast. And it takes about 15 hours to fly from Cairo, Egypt, in North Africa to Johannesburg in South Africa. So it's, it's a much, much larger continent, uh, much wider than North America. Um, the diversity in Africa is really astounding. You, you need to keep in mind that, that Africa isn't a country, but a continent made up of 54 different countries. And within those countries, there are uh, more, than eight, sorry, more than 800 languages spoken, more than 1,000 ethnic groups, and close to 800 million people. Um, now, to talk about dynamism in Africa today, we have with us um, a really, uh, we're very fortunate to have with us a really outstanding guest, George Collinet, who's an ethnomusicologist and a radio producer of Afropop Worldwide, uh, which aired on The Voice of America for more than 25 years. Um, George, can you tell us something about dynamism in African music? Sure. Uh, I, as you were mentioning, Michael, it's, Africa is not, is not a country. It's a continent. And on that continent, we have some... Uh, Oh, the music over there is as diverse as the people of Africa. And a lot of people think that African music is just tom-toms and drums and so, and so on and so forth. But in fact, you know, music in Africa comes out of the village. And it's the music that the, the kids are listening to, the mothers and the grandmothers are playing that type of music. And they take that music and they adapt it to uh, uh, modern instruments that were brought by, uh, by the people from Europe. And they have adapted this music, these instruments so well that they sound now like the traditional instruments. And that's what makes it so fascinating. And uh, you have, as I said, so many different uh, music styles. But we have divided them in four parts. So we're going to listen to, let's say, the music from West Africa. All right, so uh, Chris and Tiana, we, you just heard that music from West Africa. What do you think of? Very fun. Something you were listening to. And Chris? It had, like a, had um, a lot of drums in it, like maracas and other things. Well, actually, the music from uh, West Africa is... They, they, there is a common thing going on under, underlining it. It's uh, the music of the griots. The griots were the troubadours. They were the uh, the historians of uh, the at the courts of the 
the Mandingo emperors, and they were telling the history of uh, of the of the uh, the empire, and they use an instrument called a kora. Kora is a 21 harp lute, 21 string harp lute, that is played all throughout this region of Africa. Therefore, it gives it that link, I suppose, between the different uh, the different countries of West Africa. Now we're going to go to Central Africa. Well, you saw that Chris, you were dancing. You like that, right? Yeah, it sounds a lot like music that comes from Latin America and the Caribbean. And Taylor? A lot of maracas, stuff yeah. that you like to dance to. <laughs> you like to dance to, right. Actually, it's one of the most popular music in Africa. It's the sukus that, you, uh, that you've uh, heard there. And these are, this is the music of the people of the Congo. I mean, the, there was also, were also some, some makosa from my country, the Cameroon. And it has a link. It's that pulsating rhythm, and that you find also in, in the Latin America, in the Americas, uh, as, and it's called now Latin American music, so it comes from there. Now let's go to South Africa. <laughs> Well, that's totally different, right? Yeah, it is. It sounds like a music that you dance to, like at a party, at like a party or a wedding. Bas basically, the same thing. It's like used to celebrate something you listen to for celebrating. Well, that's what it is. It's but you've noticed also that there's a lot of vocals there, right? And that's because in uh, in the 1800 American troubadours used to go to South Africa and. Uh, and play uh, around, I mean, present their show there. And so the, uh, South African, the South Africans loved it and adapted it to their own style of music called Mbakanga. Now, we're going to go to North Africa and East Africa, and we're going to go live with Hassan Tuari. Bravo, bravo. Hassan, this instrument looks like a medieval lute. It's, what, it's, it's uh, the oud, right? This is an oud, and this is from uh, 
North Africa originated from Egypt, but has spread to all North Africa, uh, North East Africa, and to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And you learned to play, you're from Somalia, first of all, we yes. should say that. Yes. And you learned to play this instrument uh, when you were a kid? I learned to play when I was 11 years old by watching older boy taking a lesson uh, to learn how to Really? Yes. It was that popular in, in Somalia? Uh, in music, it's popular, but to play as a student, it might not be very popular. But uh, did you have a hard time learning this? Because uh, I know that in Africa, parents don't like their kids to be uh, musicians. Uh, that was the difficult part of it. I had a fun playing it and learning it outside of the house, but I never had a chance to have the instrument in the house. I always went to somewhere else to play. What do the word in a, in a, uh, say in, in the, this music, in your music? Uh, in my music, it tells in stories, it tells in events, it talks about life, and it, it, it tells in a story, basically. Okay, well, we're going to see you again a little later on, and uh, we're going to move on to uh, Dotty, you're on. Thank you, George, and thank you, Hassan, for that beautiful performance. I have with me two students. I have Jessica and Carol. And we just heard Hassan talking about his experience as a child learning to play a musical instrument. Do either one of you play? Yes, we do. I play the flute. And I play piano. And what were some of, what were some of the similarities you heard in the music that we just listened to and, and to music that you listen to today? Well, one of the biggest similarities was that all music is about emotion. It can be about pride. It can be something sad. But it's all about how you feel. What about you, Carol? Um, I know that personally, I really felt that the Central African music was really great. You know, it had a really good beat, it had a good rhythm. Um, it reminded me a lot of the Caribbean music, and it had a real tropical feeling to it, and it was very danceable like. And I liked hearing how uh, the, it was the music from Central Africa that's influenced the Caribbean music and the Latin right, American yeah. music. It, it really goes to show the global impact that Africa has. Right. Mm -hmm. What were some of the differences you noticed? Um, well, one of the biggest differences was the presence of drums. Um, that's not as typical. We have a lot of synthesizers and other guitars and instruments, but the drums made it sound more traditional. Um, yeah, I noticed like a lot of a cappella, a lot of voices, which is you know a little bit different. Okay, I have an email question from Kane. Kane wants to know: Do kids have lots of activities to do in Africa? Why don't we go to Michael, and maybe he can bring in Hassan to answer this question for us. Um, whether... Hey, Hassan, the question is, what, what kinds of activities children engage in in Africa? Uh, they engage a lot of different things. They engage playing games, uh, swimming, playing soccer, uh, and also being part of their family, running certain chores. So play and work, both? Both. Back to you, Dottie. I have another email question from Ali at the, at the Albany Academy. She wants to know what people in the Democratic Republic of Congo call the Democratic Republic of Congo. Do they call it that or do they have a, a special name for it? Michael, can you help us with that question? Sure. Um, the Democratic Republic of Congo is the official name of uh, the country who has, that has uh, Kinshasa as its capital. So it's sometimes referred to uh, as Congo, Kinshasa, just to, to make it easier. Uh, it's important to differentiate it from the Republic of Congo next door, which is a smaller country whose capital is Brazil. It, uh, sorry, Brazzaville. And it's sometimes referred to as Congo Brazzaville. Okay. Africa has a long, diverse history that begins with the origins of humankind and leads up to contemporary challenges today. This next video we're going to look at shows us some of these moments in time. History surrounds us. Our ancestors' voices are a source of strength and wisdom. Even today, their trials and triumphs guide us. <laughs> I'm Mary Jo Arnoldi. I'm an anthropologist here at the Smithsonian, and I think I have the best job at the Smithsonian because 
because I get to work in Africa. And when I've traveled throughout Africa and talked to Africans on the continent and here in Washington, one of the things that always comes up is their pride in African history. It's a long and dynamic history, and they've been connected to the world for thousands of years. From the great empires on the Nile Valley of Egypt and Nubia, to their neighbor Ethiopia, to the West African kingdoms, to kingdoms in Central Africa and in Southern Africa. And I bet you didn't know that some of those kingdoms are still alive and well today in Africa. One of those kingdoms is the kingdom of Benin in the present day country of Nigeria. And behind me is the photograph of the king or Oba of Benin who was crowned in 1997. Benin, he's the 35th king in an unbroken line of kings that date back to the 15th century. And that's the period we want to look at today because in the 1400s, Europeans started sailing for the first time down the coast of Africa. And let's, why don't you come with me and we'll go ask our historian and expert, Linda Haywood, about just what, why did Europeans come down the coast of Africa, Linda? Well, Mary, the first Europeans to come to West Africa were the Portuguese, and they came for three things. The three G's, God, gold, and glory. God, and, gold, and glory. Yes. And when they went to the Gold Coast, the region they called Costa da Mina, the coast of gold, they did find the gold. A few years later, they went down to Central Africa and found some kingdoms in Central what Africa. What kingdoms were in Central Africa? Well, Linda? the two main kingdoms or, or states which they encountered were the state of the Kingdom of Congo, which was a state already in existence before the Portuguese came. It's now in the northern part of the country called Angola. And they also found in Angola another kingdom called the Kingdom of Ndongo. And what was the relationship of Congo and Ndongo to the Portuguese, and who ruled? Well, one of the things that the Portuguese tried to do, at first they wanted to get God in, so they converted the kingdom, the king and the kingdom of Congo, and they, the Congolese did not want the Portuguese to control their kingdom. So what the Portuguese did was to ally themselves with the, Portuguese, with the Congolese, help them, and in fact slaves come out of that. Some of the first slaves from Central Africa came from the kingdom of the Congo. Then the Portuguese went just the lo lower south and went to the region of Luanda in the kingdom of Ndongo, and they in fact controlled a part of the kingdom of Ndongo. And who was the ruler of Ndongo? Well, um, the ruler of Ndongo was called <laughs> Angola, but he had some children. The, the title of the king was in Angola. Uh, but the person who really played a, a very important role during this period was a famous, just incredible female called Queen Jinga. Some of you might have heard that name, N-J-A-N-G-J-I-N-G-A, -G -G because some kids in America have that name. Oh, what was... what? was her relationship with the Portuguese? Good? Bad? Well, mm -hmm. Jenga played the Portuguese for all she could get. Sometimes she played them as if she was an ally, so she converted to Christianity. Other times when the Portuguese broke their, their treaty, she would in fact try to align herself with some of the Portuguese enemies in her own kingdom, and in fact try to align herself with the Dutch who were there, as well as with the Congolese. So we have an incredible woman who was able to change at when she saw it in her interest. Interest. And her reputation and her memories lived on and on. Yeah, in fact, her reputation, even during her life, people said, this is an incredible woman. When she went to make a treaty with the Portuguese, the Portuguese did not want to give her a seat. She, in fact, called one of her maids and they had them sit on the, um, go on the, on the, on the, um, for, on the hands <coughs> and feet, and she sat on the back. She wanted to be at the same status of, as the Portuguese. Also, she would... She was in the front of her army. She was, she was very good at the bow. She also denied some of the women, some of the men, she did not want them to dress as men. She wanted to control them. But they respected her. They had her, they praised her. And they were, she was very good in, in fact, keeping her kingdom, the kingdom that she established called Matamba. She was very good at controlling that. She left Matamba to her, to her sister and what she also did was to leave memory of her because what you had was in fact she's remembered in Angola today as How a she remembered Linda 
in Angola. In Angola, she is remembered as a nationalist hero, a resistance fighter against the Portuguese. When the Angolans became independent in 1975, they named the street after. And, and we have some questions here. Daddy, who's, we're going to throw it to Daddy, who'll give us the questions. Okay, thanks, Mary Jo. We have some email questions. Zach wants to know what is the dominant religion of Africa? Mary Jo and, and Linda, can you answer this for Zach? Repeat the question, Daddy. What is the dominant religion of Africa? What's the dominant religion of Africa, Linda? Well, not Africa as a whole. In Angola, it is, in fact, uh, three religions. We have the Catholic religion. We have, in fact, Protestant, various Protestant religions. And we also have indigenous African religion, independent African religion. And elsewhere in Africa, Islam plays an important role, as well as other religions. In West Africa, Islam is very important. In Southern Africa, we have various African religions and Christianity. Okay, Dottie, do you have another question? I do. I have an email question from Brandon at the Albany Academy. Brandon wants to know if the cultures of Ethiopia and Somalia are the same in any way. Mary Jo and Linda, can you answer this for Brandon? Well, the Ethiopia and Somalia share, they've been in contact for many, many thousands of years, and they share certain life ways. They both have their own sense of their own individual histories, and so they both share and have individuality. Dottie? Okay, thank you, Mary Jo. I'm here with our students who have finished building their Akal, and what we're looking at is a cross-section of the Akal, so it's sliced down in the middle, and you can see inside of it. If I can get Carol to explain a little bit about the process of building it. Uh, well, basically, we started with um, foam pipes, and there are six major pieces, and they're connected together by Velcro pieces. And what's the significance of these pieces that are in the middle? Um, the arcs um, help make it sturdy so that it stays with bad weather and other events. And why do you have the burlap? The burlap is to keep all the rain and things from inside of the house. And what else could be used to cover the akal? Um, matting, like um, that's weaved. It has like a design on the back. It, um, I think I saw a straw on the one in the exhibit over there. And, and families used different materials to build their akals, and, and that's what made each akal sort of unique to that family and said something about that family. Okay, guys, what I'm going to need you to do is break down this Akal. But before we do that, can you tell me how, how long it took you to build it? It took us about, um, I'd say, four to five minutes this so time. Pretty easy to yes. assemble. What I'm going to need you to do now is take it apart and move. Okay, we need to move the animals to a new pasture, find a new source of water. So we're going to have you reset up the Akal in a different location in the exhibit, and then we're going to come back to you and check on that. Okay. okay? Just as in the United States, there are lots of different jobs, lots of different ways of working for Africans, and there are lots of different kinds of wealth. Wealth is in the, can be in the form of money or knowledge or, collection, or connections between people. We're going to look at a video now that highlights some of the different kinds of jobs people can have and some of the different ways they value this wealth. Hi, it's Michael Mason again, and we're in the market crossroads of the exhibition. Um, I'm here with Peter Papim, who's originally from Ghana, and um, 
the footage that you just saw is uh, from a market in Ghana, from the city of Accra. Peter, um, can you help the students understand something about how markets work in, in Ghana? Uh, a market, it's an open air stall and a very vibrant place. You hear many, many languages going on at the same time. Uh, it's the place where you can buy, sell, or trade. So it's a very important nerve of economy. So you've got all that kind of exchange, things coming in and out. And it happens that we have a phone call coming in from Massachusetts right now. Nancy, are you there? Yes. What's your question? Well, my question is, it, it, I was watching this program and it was very interesting to me. But as a Cape Verdean American, I was wondering why, when you were describing Africa, and especially during the musical portion, they did not mention the Cape Verde Islands and the influence of their music throughout Europe and all. I mean, after all, the islands are called the islands of Cape Verde. Yeah, the, we, um, we were looking at different kinds of music from around Africa. So we went to West Africa, to Central Africa, to Southern Africa, and to Northern Africa. Unfortunately, it's not possible to, for us to visit all 56 countries in Africa in, in an hour program. But it's true that Cape Verde has just tremendous music, which has had a had been deeply influenced by music from Portugal and uh, has had a, a very powerful influence in the United States. Now, Peter is going to talk to us about um, cloth in Ghana. Um, if we, we'd like to talk about three different kinds of cloth. And um, Peter, can you help us understand the way people use cloth to communicate? It's a, it's a way of presenting themselves to their, to their neighbors and their friends. Absolutely. We find that in, in universal world, we need clothing for many reasons, either to warm ourselves or to protect our bodies. The, in Ghana situation, uh, we wear clothing to illustrate one, not only aesthetics uh, or to beautify your body, but also to demonstrate what event one is attending. Um, the, the color perceptions are quite important, as well as the design age of the cloth because most of them are symbolic. Uh, it, what we have here are blue and um, white, which is basically colors for celebrating a birth of a child, or a naming of a child, or wedding, um, any occasion which is uh, very happy, and then those colors are used. How, how about the, um, the other wax prints that we have, the, the multicolored prints? The multicolored prints are doing ideally what the black and white, the black and blue, you know, the white and blue are doing, uh, but except that those are a little bit vibrant in terms of you know, the colors that are incorporated in them. But when it gets a little bit darker, then of course it goes into a different level where funeral comes in. Now each, each cloth has a different name, right? A, a proverbial name or, or a symbol, has symbols on it that, that refer to proverbs. Can you talk about the proverbs that are on your cloth? Sure, I can do. Uh, this is a cloth that popularly known as Edinkra. Edinkra literally means bidding farewell or saying goodbye. Um, it was intended to be used in the past as a funeral cloth. Um, what are uh, illustrating this textile is that every design that is seen in this are stamped and the stamps are made of calabash and then dipped into bad deer, um, uh, back of a tree, which is uh, cooked and mixed into um, ink. Uh, the, there are proverbs, or there are symbolic expressions in them. Uh, the first of all, let's begin with this one, uh, which is known as Jinyame. Jinyame literally means the omnipotence of God. Um, symbolizing uh, reliance and also um, safety because you believe in the creator and therefore um, your life will never come to an end because if God die, then you will die. If God is alive, you will live. So it's um, a symbol that expresses reliance and also um, strength and power. So when you're going to an event, you actually think about the visual effect that you want to have, but also the, the proverbs that would, that would be carried on the cloth. Precisely, you're thinking about what message are you, you want to convey to the event that you are attending, being a wedding or being a funeral. You are thinking about what you want to convey. And if you are a rich person, then you can have many of these um, with 
a specific design incorporated into it. But if you are poor like me, then you have many designs in one so that you can illustrate more than one symbol. And that way you can wear the cloth to different kinds of events. Exactly. Um, depending upon the color scheme. If it's brighter, then it's wedding and others. If it's darker, then it's for funeral. I see. Let, let's go over here. We've got some students with us um, who've been thinking about and working on cloth for a while. Um, we have Gabby, Monique, and their teacher, Nancy. Um, can, can you talk to us about the cloth that you've been working on? Yes, this one is a cloth of a hairstyle for a war hero. And this one is a, the Sankofa, the Sankofa, which means um, wisdom of learning from the past. C could you hold them up so that the cameras can get a good shot of them? And how did you make these, these bags? How did you make the cloth? Well, the cloth was already there. We just um, made stamps. We cut them out of um, sponges, and then we dipped them into printer's ink, and we printed on the bags. We're going to demonstrate how the students did this. You can cut out your design. You can choose your pattern, and you can cut them out of either uh, compressed sponges. You can use foam. You can use the top of a styrofoam egg carton. You could even use potatoes. And of course, you could use gourds, as they did in Africa. Um, you can also attach something to make the handle a little bit easier. And you can reuse these stamps over and over again. We're printing on a cloth. You could certainly print on a piece of paper. You could make it into wrapping paper or bags, t-shirts, or these are usable. The students have made bags that they can carry things around in. It seems like you have a very interest in coming from Africa, and uh, we just want to ask you a few questions about how uh, did you get interest in these designs? Well, this one has to do with hair of war and power, and I'm really interested in hair, and I could say that in some ways that my brother used to say that I'm a lot of powerful, so I like this. I see. So your, your emphasis for um, picking up this design is the, the power elements about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you look at the design before you de developed the interest or you had the context of it or the meaning of it before? Yeah, at the same time. At the same time. Yeah. So you're combining both visual and also philosophical. Yes. yes. All right. What about you? You got um, a design which is different than um, hers. Um, how did you choose yours? I um, just really like the design, knowing that it looks sort of like a heart. Okay. What was the name of your design? The Sankofa. Um, Sankofa. Okay. Uh, literally meaning uh, retrieving from the past. Uh, did you know about that meaning before you chose that? No, I didn't. You didn't know. No. But you are just a visual expressionist. You, you like the design yeah. composition, and you chose that one. That's interesting. Um, I believe that when you're carrying this, you know, if people ask you um, who made it, how are you going to tell, what are you going to tell them? Um, I don't know. You don't know? No. Uh, did you make it yourself? Yeah, I made it myself. That's, the, that's what I'm implying. Okay. Uh, you made this yourself. So um, the next question is that if it happens that, you know, what they ask you the same question, why did you choose the designs, then you're going to tell them what? Because I like the design. You like the design. Now, Peter, okay. the, the Sankofa refers back to the importance of the past, a, a theme that we've been talking about a lot today. Mm -hmm. um, it, we also have an example here in the exhibition of a, of a coffin from Ghana um, made by Ga people around Accra. And um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how the funeral is also a way of looking back and honoring the past. Okay. One thing we have to understand is that if there was no yesterday, we wouldn't have today, and uh, maybe there will be no tomorrow. Um, Sankofa literally means the retrieving from the past um, will signify that our forebearers have left some knowledge with us and we can always go back to them and retrieve this knowledge to make our today a meaningful um, day. Um, in other words, if I'm going to a funeral and I would like to reflect you know, the essence of their wisdom, I may choose to wear um, a design composition in a dinkra with Sankofa in it to illustrate the fact that they have left me something that I would like to use in the present day. And, and someone who's, someone who's uh, had a, a, a life of, 
of wealth and, and privilege might choose to be buried in a, in a coffin that looks like an airplane to express that, that life. Uh, now we're going back to Dottie, um, and uh, she'll take some questions, I think. Thanks, Michael. I have an email question from Kirsten Garvey at Brownsville Junior High School. She wants to know if Africans wear the same things as Americans. And we just saw Michael and Peter talking about uh, some of the cloths that are made by Africans and how they wear them. But my question is, uh, Peter and Michael, are there any cases where Africans do wear the same things as Americans do? Um, Americans actually, Africans actually wear the same kinds of clothes as Americans in, in lots of different places. Um, Peter, what's, uh, what's, standard, what's standard wear in Kumasi, where you, your family's from? Um, what, what's standard? The, the question is whether, American, whether there are places in Africa where, where they wear the same kinds of clothes as Americans. Of course, yes. Every day where it's, you know, T-shirts and shirts and people who dress in suits to go to work and so forth. It depends upon the nature of work that you do. But when it comes to a setting where one has to be formal, you see more of traditional in outfits than a regular, you know, day outfit. But of course, when it comes to the market women, they are always in their traditional outfit. Okay, thanks. Back to you, Dottie. Thanks, Michael. I have another e email here from Phil. Phil wants to know at what age is a kid seen as, a, as an adult and what responsibilities do the kids have? Michael and Peter, can we get you to answer this question for Phil? Sure. Remember, Africa, again, is a continent and not a country. There, there are thousands of different cultures in Africa, and so it depends a great deal uh, on where you're talking about. Um, we'll be talking in a little bit about Somalia, but maybe Peter can talk about Fanti culture and when a child uh, is seen a, becomes an adult. When a child becomes an adult. Uh, number one, uh, we go through stages of life, birth, living, and death. Uh, for a child to become an adult, you think about the age between 14 and above. Um, how do we determine? It depend, it, it, it's determined by your uh, experiences in life and your accomplishments in life between the age of between 14 and 18. So at the 18, then of course, to not, I won't put age on it, but your accomplishment. We have been saying that if a child learns how to wash his or her hands well, that child can partake food with an adult. Ah, so, so there's, some, there's some sense of what they're, able, what they're capable of as individuals that helps determine whether or not they're seen the as an adult. the community will judge by what you do. Great. Back to you, Dottie. Thanks, Michael and Peter. Just as in America, there are, there's a great diversity in Africa and different ways of living. And since Africa is such a large continent, there are many, many different ways of living. What we're going to do now is look at a video that introduces us to some of these different ways. In every journey, past and present, we carry Africa within us. Today, our voices, African voices, speak from every corner of the earth. Hi, you've just been looking at Ghana with Peter and Michael. Now we're going to take a look at another country, Somalia, which is in the northeast of Africa. Somalia is about a little bit smaller than Texas, and it has about 9,500,000 people living there, and that's about mm, maybe the size of the city of Houston itself. Somalia is a very ancient country which has been connected around the world for thousands of years. It was connected to Egypt, it was connected to the Middle East, it was connected to India and to China, well before Europeans actually came to Somalia. And one of the lifestyles that we're going to look at today in Somalia that's very ancient but also very contemporary is nomadic herding life, where families move with their herds over a period of weeks to new pasture land and new water sites. Let's 
see what it means for a nomadic person or what Somalia means, what pride they have in nomadic life. Let's look at this little film here. When I think of Somalia, I think of the three most important things in my culture, poetry, camels, and the akal. As a Somali-American, this will always be part of my life. So you've just seen Abdi on film, and we've got Abdi here to answer all your questions. Okay. Abdi, you grew up in a nomadic camp and moved with your family with, and herding camels and sheep and goats. Can you tell us what that life was like? Yes, uh, I have a fond memories of my nomadic life as a child, and especially when it's a rainy season. And it's, a, it's a good life in the nomadic life. You have the water and a pasture for the animals. It's the time that we have a fun as a children and play games and wrestle. And we play with bows and arrows, we play wrestle. Similar, we have the same, same game as children here. We, we play you know, hide and seek and similar games. However, there mm -hmm. are times that life is difficult, especially when it's a dry season. And what happens then? Well, the families have constantly to move from place to place in search of a water and a pasture for the animals. And you move your houses each time yes. the family moves. Each time you have to move the akal, which, is, um, which fits to the life of the nomadic. It's suitably built to fit that life. Uh, it's built by women mostly. It's the ingenuity of a woman. <laughs> Um, Always good. To design the acolytes. <laughs> it's portable. It can fit into the back of a camel, one or two camels. And um, I know I, that you said in the piece that, in the film, that the akal is almost a symbol of nomadic life, just like the camel is. It is. It's a focal point of a nomadic life. It's where the home is. And although the nomadic li uh, families move from place to place, the akal gives the nomadic life a sense of a permanence. Um, okay, so there's permanence in movement. Yes. What would you find in a house and what do people take with you? And well, as you see the akal behind me, and this is the shape that it is dome like a building. And when you look at that from the surface, it doesn't look good, but when you go inside, it's very beautiful. A lot of people are getting. The materials that you have in are all essential. You don't carry non-essential things with akal because you have to put it on the back of a camel. So we have a container here, wooden container that you have a milk, milk and a water, and which water. is essential. And why do you have mats on the floor? Is that where you would sleep? Exactly, that's where you sleep. Here we have a headrest for the camel boy uh, to have a nap in the middle of the day when Did they are Did you ever watch the, camel. the camels yes. and use the yes. headrest? Yes. Okay. We have and a wooden container here mm -hmm. and, and for the woman to put essential things that they use, including incense, which women use. Um, and I also see there's a radio back there. Somalis are a very informed society. Even the nomadic people listen to radios. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, so they have a portable shortwave radio and they listen to BBC Somali service to get news of the world. Well, let's look at how, uh, let's look at how this, the house actually goes up. And this is a house that was being put up here in the Smithsonian with the help of the Somali community, women from the Somali community here in Washington. What are they doing here in this film? Well, I see Hassan's in it too. <laughs> what, you see, what you see is the akal pin uh, uh, pilt, and those are the sticks that made the fundamentals of the akal. It's called the udbo. They are grounded uh, on the earth a um, few inches deep. Here we and had to put them in buckets of sand, but in, when you're actually in Somalia, they're drove, driven into the earth. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, they're driven into the earth, and they are tied together by robes and, 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 and robes made of a hide and uh, skin of the, of the, of the cattle or, or a camel. And then to and cover it finally, what we'll see them doing is unrolling these beautiful mats exactly. that are made by women. Exactly. And women actually sing songs to their mats. Yeah, they have a work songs when they are um, weaving the, the mats. A lot of women are getting to this. Sometimes it's built for a long time. And it's mm -hmm. something that women learn from early on in their life to, to build those mats. And I see our nomadic family has arrived here <laughs> at, in another part of Somalia. How was it, re -putting, taking it down and putting it up again? <laughs> okay, what do you have it here? Um, okay, what are they? <laughs> there is a bunny rabbit, that was mine. There's 
her picture of them two because they're best friends. Okay. Okay. So okay. Well, in the, in the nomadic house. Can you, you put your mic to the kids yet? <laughs> uh, when? In, the, in the nomadic house, you would often have a water container that's very essential. Like you have those essentials here. How long did it take you to build this? Very fast this time. And the one in the in the nomadic, it often takes about three to four hours to to build the one. <laughs> and do you have any questions for me? Yeah, I have one question. Does like if it's like raining or if there's like a sandstorm, does that affect like how long it takes the woman women to put up in a call? Uh, yes, actually, um, the agility of the akal, how sturdy it is, defines the woman. So they're very careful in the beginning when they're building it. They have to have the right materials, the right sticks, which is durable, so that it can endure the torrential rains, the winds, and it can stay for a long time. What we know that many Somalis, about 60%, still live in a nomadic herding life, but also Somalis live in town. And let's go ask Hassan, who grew up in town, what life was like growing up in a Somali town. Uh, Somali town is like any other Somali, uh, any other cities in, in the world. Uh, you grow up and going to school, and you go to movies, you play soccer, you swim, you hang out with your friends and your neighborhoods, just like any other kid will do. Well, I heard that um, someone told me that town kids and nomadic kids used to have a lot of joking relationships. So what do you think about town kids? Well, that, that's, that's true, Mary. Um, we consider them um, nomadic children. We consider them town, town kids are very soft. They cannot endure the harsh life that we do. Um, they're afraid of predators like lions and hyenas, we don't, which we don't afraid of. So we consider them very soft. Town so kids. what do the town kids say back? Uh, town kids say if the nomads come to town, they don't know how to use the little gadgets. They don't know how to turn the stove on. They don't know how to turn the light on. They have no clue what's going on in the house. So part of the fun, all joking aside, part of the fun is teasing one another. But what really unites town people and country people is this great tradition of Somali music, Somali poetry, and Somali art. And Hassan, would you share some of that music with us? Yep. And while Hassan is playing, we'll take a look at a film which will let all of you see what the great diversity of Somali life is. let you get away with this. Can you give us another short piece? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hi. 
going to go back to Dottie, who's going to wrap this up for you. Thanks, Mary Jo. I do have a couple of email questions here. Jordan wants to know what sports do people play? And Kane has a similar question. Do kids have lots of activities to do in Africa? So let's go to Mary Jo, and maybe she can get Abdi and Hassan to talk a little bit about the sports and the activities that kids play. We have a question about what do kids play? Maybe you and Hassan, Abdi, can talk about what kids play. Well, um, soccer is one of the favorable sports in Somalia. Uh, almost every child uh, would love to play soccer. And that's probably and, true all over Africa. Yeah. And there are other traditional games that uh, play. In the nomadic life, we don't have a soccer. Mm. Normally, we will play other games, you know, like uh, um, traditional games. Okay. And, but in the cities, they also have a basketball and similar games that it's you have here. here. In terms of assurance, you know, mm -hmm. the nomadic children tend to be, you know, do a lot of things. They tend after, you know, the goats and sheep and calves. So and it's the, chores and games together. Exactly. Okay, Dottie, do you have another question? Back to Dottie. I do, Mary Jo. Nikki Landon wants to know, do most people in Africa have children of their own? The question is, do most people in Africa have children of their own? And I think that Abdi, who's a new dad, can answer how important children are to Africans. I think you can speak for all of Africa here. Um, I think um, um, family is, is, is a central unit of, of most of African society. Family is valued, mm -hmm. and so does marriage and, and, and marriage life. So um, it's, it's the hope of every uh, able man to get married and have a children. children. And every and, woman and raise, to have yeah, children. And, and every woman to have a children and so raise. And so families stay longer. Okay. Uh, and it's actually taboo in some cultures to get divorced. Oh, and and okay. so they, they tend to stay, stay longer. Together. And, yeah, together. Okay, thank you, Abdi, for sharing that with us. And back to Dadi. Thanks, Mary Jo. And this brings us to the conclusion of our electronic field trip, African Voices. I'd like to thank our Smithsonian scientists and our experts who are here with us today, as well as the students who are here with us in the exhibit. And I'd like to thank you for watching and for calling in with your questions and your emails. I'd like to thank the sponsors of this program, Project Views, Schenectady City School District, the Smithsonian Institution, and Ball State University. And I'd like to invite you to join us in May when we go to Mali in Africa to do our next live electronic field trip.